The Possession of Daphne Degemensi. I first met Daphne Degemensi at Sefakoy Lise in Istanbul. It was our first day of high school and I didn't know anyone. I was a shy child and I usually kept to myself, but my parents had told me how important it was to make new friends. We were all wearing uniforms, of course, but Daphne made hers look like haute couture, with a stunning gemstone hung around her neck on a leather string. She stood out from the crowd as though she was the only other person in the world. The playground seemed to shrink around us until there was only the two of us. I made my way over to her and said hello, and she reached out and took my hand. Hi, she said, with a voice like an angel. I'm Daphne, what's your name? Zainab, I replied. I love your necklace. It's a garnet, Daphne said. My birthstone. I was born in January, see? January 18th. My birthday is the 20th, I said. I tell you what, I'll invite you to my birthday party if you invite me to yours. That sounds fair, Daphne replied. Something tells me we're going to be friends. And we were too. Daphne and I were 13 years old and so was her cousin, Muja. She went to Kadri and Moroglu, but we spent a lot of time together in the evenings and at the weekends. We were as good as inseparable during the summer. We used to hang around at my place while my parents were at work, making a nuisance of ourselves. We'd watch more than our fair share of American TV, it's how most of us learned English, and had learned that prank phone calls were the best way for kids to pass a lazy afternoon. Our favourite was to call the restaurants and kebab sellers and to ask for huge ass. We'd gather around the receiver and try to hold our laughter in for as long as we could. That's how most of us learned to swear in Turkish. When we weren't making prank phone calls, we were taking photos on disposable cameras. This was back in the 90s, way before smartphones. Mobile phones were around, but I didn't know anyone who had one. They were for businessmen, politicians and actors in the TV shows we used to watch. Digital cameras were a little more common, but I didn't know anyone who had one of those either. And so my friends and I used disposable cameras instead. We'd get them as birthday gifts and save them up until the summer, when we'd have plenty of time to take photos. They weren't exactly cheap to develop into prints, and so we weren't like the kids of today who take a thousand selfies to get the perfect shot. We spent ten minutes making sure everything was perfect, hit the shutter button and hope for the best. We wouldn't find out if the photo was any good until we'd pick the prints up. We were just normal kids, or as normal as kids ever are. Daphne was beautiful, but we were still so young that she didn't know it. That was the summer when she started to develop, but except for a couple of creepy stares from the old guys in the piazzas, we hardly noticed. No, we were just normal kids until that night in the summer of 96. Daphne had invited us to her place. I'd been there a couple of times before, but her parents treated her like a princess and I was just another commoner, so they didn't like having me over. That suited me just fine because their house was three times the size of mine and seemed as old as the Ottoman Empire, at least to me. It creeped me out, especially the attic, and that was where Daphne wanted us to play. Her parents had gone out to the theatre, which meant that Daphne, Muja and I had the place to ourselves. we just called a kebab shop and asked for Mike Roch, and when the laughter had died down, Daphne took on a look of serious serenity and said, Hey, I've got an idea. Oh, Muja replied, what's that then? Follow me, Daphne said. I've got another game for us to play. Daphne led us out of the living room, where the house's only telephone was, and upstairs onto the landing. She grabbed a short metal pole with a fork on the end of it, climbed onto her tiptoes, and unhooked the trapdoor in the ceiling that led to the attic. When the door dropped open, a rope ladder fell out and dangled in the air, its bottom rung a foot or so above the floor. Daphne gestured towards me and said, you first. We're going into the attic? No, Daphne said, we're going to the moon. Okay, okay, I replied, point taken. I gritted my teeth and climbed into the attic. At first I couldn't see a thing, but then I heard Daphne climbing up behind me and after her boots hit the ground on the battered floorboards, she pulled a cord and light flooded over us. I didn't even notice Muja climbing up last and closing the trapdoor. I was too busy casting my eyes around the room, which was a disappointment. The attic was mostly empty, although there were a couple dozen cardboard boxes pushed against a back wall and partially covered by old bed sheets. The floor was covered with dust and grime, and the windowless walls were draped with cobwebs. Daphne had drawn a pentagram on the floor in white chalk, and she had placed a candle on each of the five points. She went over to them and lit them with a box of matches that she pulled out from a pocket in her jeans. Then she gestured for us to each take a seat and turn the lights back off. What's going on? I asked. I was uneasy, but Daphne had such magnetism that Muja and I would have followed her anywhere. This is creepy, Daphne. I don't like it. We're going to play a game, Daphne replied. I could hear her moving about behind me, and then she shuffled around and back to my left. She had a box with her, which she opened up. Then she took out the board and placed it in the middle of the pentagram. 
She placed the planchette above the G and goodbye. Do you know what this is? She asked. I do, Muja said. It's a Ouija board. People use it to contact the dead. They do, Daphne replied. But I don't believe in all of that. It's just the people using it subconsciously moving it. Let's play. We shouldn't play with that thing. It's just a game, Daphne insisted. It's made by Hasbro. Still, Daphne. Oh, don't be such a baby, she said. Come on, put your fingers on the planchette. You too, Zainab. That's it, just like that. She looked at the two of us and waited until we were in position. Then she turned her attention back to the board. We call upon the spirit world, Daphne said. We welcome any spirits that would like to talk to us. As if on cue, the candles went out as an unseasonably cold breeze passed through the attic. I shivered and wrapped my arms around myself, wishing I'd thought to wear a cardigan. Daphne lit another match and quickly passed it from one wick to another. Is there anyone here who wants to speak to us? At first there was nothing. Then I felt a slight vibration and the planchette moved slowly but surely to the top left corner where it stopped over the yes. Are you doing that, Daphne? Muja asked. Be quiet, Daphne hissed. I was already way ahead of her. Even if I'd wanted to talk, I don't think I would have been able to. I noticed that as Daphne spoke, her breath left a cold mist in the air. It had been 26 degrees outside. What do you want? Daphne asked. There was a silent stillness to the air. The planchette started crawling across the wooden surface of the board like a cockroach in a nuclear wasteland. Why, oh, you. Me, Daphne said. You want me? Why? Daphne, please. We have to finish, Daphne insisted. She turned back to the board and added, Why do you want me, spirit? The planchette started to move again. D-E-A-T. Please, Muja repeated. She sprung to her feet like a coiled snake, taking her hands off the planchette and breaking the circle. Daphne, this isn't funny. I'm not doing anything, she protested. I stood up too, and I was hot on Muja's heels as she raced towards the hole in the floor that led back to the house below. I'm sorry, Def, I said. Muja's right, this is too much, even for me. But I didn't do anything, Daphne said. Maybe she didn't, but that night changed everything. And in hindsight, I also realised that when she blew out the candles and followed us out of the attic, she forgot to close the connection by saying goodbye to the spirit. Muji was so freaked out that she stopped hanging out with us. I still spent time with Daphne, but only at school. I kept myself to myself during the summer, and on the rare occasions where she asked me to go out or to stay over at her house, I came up with an excuse. I'd been disturbed by the Ouija session, but Muji had seen it as an affront to Allah. I've never been particularly religious, although I consider myself a believer, but to me it was just an affront to common sense. Years passed, and after we graduated high school, Daphne and I lost touch. I moved to England to study for my degree, but I went back to stay with my parents during the summer. I met Erdem when I was back home at the end of my second year. We started dating, and we've been together ever since. On January, I was back in Istanbul for my birthday in Eid when I ran into Muja at the hairdressers. I hadn't seen her since our teenage years, and so we had plenty of gossip to catch up on. There was an elephant in the room that we did our best to skirt around, but it was such a big elephant that we had to address it eventually. It was Muja who broke the silence. Do you remember Daphne? she asked. How could I forget? I replied. I haven't seen her since we left school, though. I haven't seen her since that night, Muja replied, you know. Yeah, I said. And I did know. She's my cousin and family is family, Muja said. But I just couldn't face seeing her again. I hear about her, though. My father and her father speak on the phone a couple of times a month. How is she? She's been better, Muja told me. Father says she's been fainting and having seizures. They've sent her to doctors and psychologists to see if they can figure out what's wrong, but they haven't been able to diagnose her. And without a diagnosis, they can't treat her. Did she ever, I mean, was she okay after that day in the attic? I never knew her to faint or have a seizure, I said. She never even took a day off school. Well, she's changed a lot over the last few years, Muja replied. She started making predictions about car crashes, murders and things like that. She'll start babbling in the middle of a seizure and no one will be able to make sense of it until they look back on it afterwards. The power of hindsight. Exactly, Muja said. At least that's what it is for us. But it seems like Daphne has the gift of foresight. She knew about the Russian plane that crashed last year, according to her father at least. And you trust what he says, I asked. What I mean is, do you think he's exaggerating? I, I'm not sure, Muja admitted. He told my father that when she makes her predictions, her voice gets deeper, but perhaps that's just the seizures. The hairdressers had finished with her, but no one else was waiting, and it seemed as though the staff were just as absorbed in our conversation as we were. 
She carried on talking as my own hairdresser took care of my split ends. Daphne was always curious about psychics and ghosts and stuff, Muja continued. She believed in the healing power of crystals and all that junk. Do you remember that gem she used to wear around her neck? Garnet. What? It was Garnet, I said, her birthstone. She thought it would bring her good luck. I don't think it worked, Muja replied. From what I've been told, over the last couple of years, Daphne has been becoming more and more interested in the spirit world. She's been using the Ouija board again, only this time she's talking to the dead by herself. Her parents hate it, but what can they do? They could take the board away. They did, Muja said. They locked up the attic too. Daphne didn't go to university and she's still living with her folks, but she's got a car now and she's a grown woman. They can't exactly lock her up in her bedroom. It can't be that bad, I said. I'm not sure about that, Muja replied. She leaned in a little closer and lowered her voice, although I'm not sure what she was hoping to accomplish. The entire barber shop was listening to our conversation. I know you've always been sceptical, Zaynep, but hear me out. I, I think she's been possessed. I'm not sure what response she was expecting, but I doubt it was the one she got. I sneezed. Perhaps we should continue this conversation another time, Muja said. Are you free tomorrow? I told her that I was, and we agreed to meet up for a walk in Bacagoy Marquez, where we hoped we wouldn't be overheard. It was, and is, a stunning neighbourhood, and it had been one of my favourite places to spend time when I was a teenage dreamer with too many books and not enough time. We stopped off to pick up a couple of cups of takeout coffee, and then strolled together through Belgrade Omani. For a while, we talked about school, the weather, and anything else we could think of, but even though she wasn't there, Daphne had a hold over us that was impossible to resist, and besides, we had a conversation to finish. Did I tell you about when she crashed my party? Muji asked. I shook my head, my eyes still focused on the trees that lined the path in front of me. It was my 18th birthday, Muji explained. I was in the year below you and so you'd already left for university, otherwise I would have invited you. Don't worry, I said, I'm not offended. I didn't invite Daphne either, Muji said. It didn't even occur to me. We hadn't seen each other for a couple of years. Besides, it was just going to be a half a dozen of us girls watching movies and doing face masks. None of us drank, and so it wasn't exactly supposed to be a wild night in. But then the phone rang. I think I can tell where this is going. It was Daphne, Muja confirmed. She said she knew there was a party happening and that she was coming over. How did she know that? She was your cousin, I reminded her, and you were turning 18. It wouldn't have been hard for her to put the pieces together. Maybe, Muja said, but I don't think she knew where my birthday was and I'd never had a party before. We hadn't spoken for years and then she showed up out of the blue at my party and ruined the whole night. What did she do? What didn't she do? Muja asked. She sighed. To begin with, it seemed like we might have a decent night, but then she started getting weird. She talked about witches and fairies, gods and goblins. She was obsessed with the children of Iblis, Dasim, Awa, Misut, Thabar and Zalampur. And then she backed Fari into a corner and asked her, how long has your mother been cheating on your father? I whistled as I inhaled sharply and flashed a glance at Muja, who had her face turned slightly away from me as though she didn't want me to see her. Yeah, Muja said. You can imagine how the rest of the night went from there. It gets weirder though. I spoke to Fari a couple of weeks later and she told me she'd confronted her mother and demanded to know the truth. Daphne was right. Now Faria's parents live separate lives and sleep in separate rooms, although they're still married in the eyes of Allah, and the law, I suppose. Why are you telling me this? I asked. Because I want to know what you think, Muja replied. You know, if we add together the seizures, the visions, the Ouija board, do you think she could be, you know, possessed? I asked. My voice sounded unnaturally loud, especially amidst the relative quiet of the forest, and it was followed by the fluttering of a dozen pairs of wings as birds took flight away from us. No, that's not possible. I mean, demons aren't real, are they? She had no answer for that. I travelled back to England after Reed, but I thought about Daphne and the story that Muja had told me every day, especially when the lights were out and I was trying to sleep. Erdem and I were engaged to be married, and so we spent much of our time going around the houses, visiting various family members and handing over invitations or receiving written RSVPs, which we were saving to put inside a scrapbook. There wasn't much time for visiting old friends, but that didn't stop them from coming to see me. One afternoon, while my parents were at work and I had the house to myself, there was a knock at the door. I peeked out through the spy hole and saw two familiar faces on the other side of the glass, although I hadn't seen one of them since I was a teenager. Muja looked exactly like she had when I'd seen her in Bakugoy Merkez and I was pretty sure she was wearing the same dress, but Daphne had changed completely. 
She was no longer the beautiful, vivacious teen I'd known at school. The one that all the boys wanted and all the girls wanted to be. She'd lost a lot of weight and it wasn't as though she'd had much going spare to begin with. Her face was particularly gaunt and her eyes had sunk into her sockets with big black bags beneath them. Her pupils were so big that it looked as though she didn't have irises and to begin with I wondered if she'd taken something. But it soon became clear that if she was high on anything it was life. And she wasn't even high on that. So, are you going to invite us in? Muja asked, looking pointedly at me and then her cousin. Sure, I replied, pushing the door open and gesturing for them to follow me inside. I'll fix us something to drink. I think there's still some tea in the Kaidalink. I led Daphne and Muja through to the kitchen where they sat down at the table. Daphne still hadn't said a word and Muja and I were making small talk about the weather because we were in the middle of a heat wave and there were rumours of a drought that would affect the water supply. I just started pouring out the tea when Daphne opened her mouth for the first time, but it was far from a friendly hello. People suffered here, she said. And she was right. I've never believed in ghosts or the spirit world, but there was something eerie about the way that Daphne was talking. Her eyes had rolled back in their sockets as though she was having another one of her seizures, but when I glanced at Muja, she simply shrugged. What do you mean? I asked. I see corpses, Daphne replied. Hundreds of them lined up on metal trays in a morgue. You might be onto something there, I murmured, not sure whether I was talking to Daphne Muja or myself. Perhaps I wasn't talking to anyone. Unlike Daphne, I knew some of the history of my parents' house. It had once been part of a hospital, one which had existed on the same grounds for several centuries. My father had done some research into it when I was a child, and he swore that he'd seen the ghost of a hospital porter and heard the screams of patients being operated on without anaesthesia. I'd never believed him, but my mother still told him to stop scaring me with his stories. His stories had never scared me though, but Daphne did. I knew right then that I wasn't going to spend another night under my parents' roof. I'd go and stay with Erdem if I had to, though tradition dictated that we should wait until after the wedding. Is it me? I asked, or is there a chill in here? I can feel it too, Muja said. Let's go and sit in the garden. We might as well enjoy the sunshine. My parents had a table and some chairs outside, and the boughs of a huge magnolia tree hung out over the garden walls, casting one corner of the yard into shade. Daphne followed the two of us outside, though she looked uncomfortable in the sunlight, and took a seat between us. She seemed a little more responsive, and even asked for more tea. Then she dropped another bombshell. The air out here reeks of aggression, she said. There's been an argument, hasn't there? I don't know, Daphne, I said, though I did. You tell me. It happened yesterday, Daphne said, her voice dreamlike and her eyes closed to the glare of the sun. I shivered in spite of the heat of the day. Your mother had words with a neighbour and now the two of them aren't speaking. Do you know what the argument was about? Daphne looked me dead in the eyes and cackled, her laughter sounding like the death rattle of a nonagenarian who'd smoked 60 cigarettes for as many years and finally succumbed to lung cancer. Then she rolled her eyes back into her skull again, looking at me with just the whites. You're testing me, Daphne said. I'm not fool, Zayna, but I expected nothing more from you and I'll play your game. She turned her head towards her left shoulder and whispered something to the air, then paused as though waiting for a response. I listened too, and so did Muja, but if Daphne was hearing anything, it was outside the scope of what our ears could hear. I see, Daphne said, though her eyes were still blind. She pointed to the house to our right. It was the people who lived there. Your mother argued with them about the noise that their dog has been making, and your father threatened to poison it. I could feel the colour draining from my face. How do you know these things? I asked, my voice little more than a whisper. I have companions, she replied. The children of Iblis are with me. Dasim tells me the goings on between closed doors, the problems between mothers and daughters and the arguments that tear families apart. Awa tells me of sex and sensuality, adultery and fornication. Misu is the bringer of news, most of which is false. He tells me the stories behind the stories and shows me what the newspapers and television channels aren't telling us. Thabar is a friend of disaster and destruction, and he tells me of death, disease, and despair. And Zalampur spreads division, exposing lies and hypocrisy. It's he who caused your parents to argue with your neighbour. I was silent for a moment as I tried to process what Daphne was telling me. Muja was quick to break the silence. It must be exhausting, Muja said. How can you live like that? They bothered me, to begin with, Daphne admitted. But it's amazing what a person can get used to. Now I can't imagine my life being any different. And besides, I have this. She threw her head back, tossing her hair over her shoulder, and then reached down to a talisman that she was wearing around her neck. It was made out of gold and was shaped into a simple oblong, with a line of Arabic text from the Quran engraved into it. 
Some would call this a sin, Daphne said, but I believe it will protect me and that it's Allah's will for me to wear it. I've made peace with the children of Iblis and they've made peace with me. Now they're always with me, the children and I living in symbiosis. Like parasites with the host, Muja muttered. I wasn't sure if Daphne heard her. Can you see them? I asked. Daphne shook her head. At the moment I can only hear them, she replied, but they've promised to become visible when I prove myself and they fully trust me. And what will that take? Daphne didn't reply. Her and Muja took their leave around ten minutes later, just as I was about to make more tea. I never saw either of them again. Postscript, back on the tour bus. That's it? Sigvardsen asked, his mouth hanging open as Zainab held out the microphone for him to take it. That's it, Zainab replied. Attends, Albert Leclerc called out, half rising from his seat as he did so. You can't just leave the story there, how does it end? Not all stories have an ending, Zainab said, handing off the mic and raising her voice slightly so that it carried to the back of the coach. Not in real life. But you must know what happened next, Leclerc insisted. Zainab sighed. She took a moment to compose herself, and it looked as though formulating her response was costing her more than just the mental effort. Erdem and I did get a letter from Muja a couple of years ago, she admitted. She hadn't seen Daphne for a while either, but she's still in touch with the family. The last she'd heard, Daphne had lost a ton of weight and looked like she was wasting away. She'd also fallen in love with a Catholic and the two of them got married, although when we got the letter, they were yet to have children. I hope they don't. Why not? Zainab opened her mouth to speak, but no words came out. She tried again, but still nothing. Her husband had to climb out of his seat and go to her rescue. We're afraid that if they do, the possession will become a curse and be passed down to the next generation, Erdem said, and if her husband tries to find an exorcist, it could kill her. Silence descended upon the coach as the passengers thought about the story they'd heard and the conclusion that Erdem had shared with them. Then Sigvardsen clapped his hands together, shocking the passengers into a dizzy rambic round of applause. That was fantastic, Mrs. Bosco, Sigvardsen said. Thank you for sharing your story with us. These tales are getting better and better. So who's next?